here. <coughs> awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Like good things in the startup community, a free lunch and free beer is always a big draw. So, uh, but at least this one you don't have to detox after. Um, so I'm Dave Parker. I'm you've got a little bit about me from an agenda perspective, but uh, Seven Peaks is an early stage venture fund. So after doing five startups of my own, so I get was able to sell three, close two. I uh, was fortunate enough to be um, uh, in involved in a n number of board roles and sold or bought nine companies total. So uh, for an investment banker, that's a super small number. For an operator, it's a pretty good number. Um, so from a background perspective, I've kind of made that shift from founder and board member to investor and board member, which has been kind of a fun shift. I'm a, I'm a Husky alum as well, so went through the communications department. Um, the computer si science department at the time wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Uh, but I'm gonna walk you through just kind of the, the ingredients of the ecosystem, a little bit about Seattle ecosystem, and if, especially if you're new or you're thinking about starting a company, kind of point you to the resources that are here in the community for you as a, as a startup founder, so you can help you navigate your way through it faster. When I started my, my first company in 1998, there was a group of about eight of us CEOs sitting around looking at each other going, I don't know, what would you do? So every once in a while I hear people go, you know, the startup ecosystem is really not that good in Seattle. I'm like, you should have been here in 98, because it's changed a lot. So we have a massive amount of free events, uh, you know, Startup Week last two weeks ago was 235 total events. And I think there were two events that were paid. One was $5 and one was $10. So, and we basically strong arm everybody who runs events to say, that's awesome, we're happy to promote your event as long as it's free. Because the startup community needs to spend money on validating your idea, not on programming. So I'm a huge fan of that at this point. So we d um, while at Up Global w until we sold up for, uh, to uh, Techstars in 2016, or 2015, in 2014, I ran global programs, so Startup Digest, Startup Weekend, Startup Next, and Startup Week. Um, and we did events in 120 countries that year uh, with about 74,000 attendees. So if you haven't been to a Startup Weekend yet, I would highly encourage you to go. You get to pitch your idea on Friday night, recruit a team to join you on your adventure, and by Sunday you get to ship a demo um, and do that demo in front of investors who say, this is what we like about the idea, this is what we find challenging in the idea. Uh, a lot of founders are scared to like, I don't want to talk about my idea, it's my precious, somebody may steal it. Or in 54 hours, you could actually ship a demo and stop thinking about it and actually go do it. So I would encourage you to take that path because the risk of somebody stealing your idea, even if we started with the same idea today, because of our life experience and technical abilities, we would end up in completely different planes of where we take those ideas. So don't worry about somebody stealing your idea, just get it out there and talk to people. So Five Ingredients White Paper, some other resources if you're interested in the community side of it. Uh, but I want to get you into Seattle specifically uh, as well. So Brad Feld wrote a book called Startup Communities. In, in Startup Communities, one of the things he outlined was this idea of the Boulder thesis. And that was that, you know, Boulder's a pretty small town, in case you haven't been there. Um, Seattle and Denver are more similar in size, but Boulder's like Bellingham or maybe Bend, right? So super small town a disproportionately percentage of the population attends Startup Week Boulder. Like 10, 12% of the entire population of Boulder attends Startup Week Boulder, right? So we had nearly 5,000 people. That was amazing for Seattle. It's not 10 or 12% in case you don't know. So there's a huge disproportionate thing there. And Iowa City is always one of the examples that I use of people who are like, wow, we built this. People are like, tell me about the startup community because they're anticipating I'll talk about San Francisco or I'll talk about Seattle. And I was like, yeah, I want to tell you about Iowa City. And people are like, Iowa City? It's a flyover state. And the answer is, yep. But because of what they did, they were able to make it into a startup community. So it's not limited to the coasts. So lots of opportunity to grow your community. So if you're not from here and you're here for school and you're going back somewhere and you're like, my community is not that yet, um, you can start that when you get back. I would encourage you to do so. Um, so specifically about Seattle, there's... The, the concept that Brad talks about in the book in startup communities is there, there's leaders and there's feeders. And if you're in the startup community, there's a, a group of f folks and organizations that are all feeders to the startup communities and they're super supportive and they need to be supportive. So as a founder, I don't exist without them. But at the same time, they don't lead the startup community. They really support the startup community. And those organizations, government, um, and say we did events in 120 countries. Uh, so I had a chance to talk with a lot of government officials like, how do we make our city more startup friendly? And interestingly enough, every country I went to um, had the same question and the answers were always the same. 
uh, back to the five ingredients of the white paper, all, all about activities. And you know, people are like, we want as a government to like go faster. And you can help, but you're not going to lead. So universities, great way, smart young folks come out of the universities. A lot of people who want to change and transition their career, however, aren't coming back to universities to learn about startups. So where do you find those resources and tools? And we get those in the community today. And the goal of that is to pri provide them a super reasonable price. <coughs> um, investors, so now that I've crossed to the dark side, I'm, I'm a supporter from that perspective, right? I'm a uh, seasoned board member. I want to come into companies early. We do seed and A round uh, funding. So it's average seed check is a half million dollars. Our average A check is a million and a half. We do just software. And we have a focus of Mountain West. So Vancouver, Canada to Phoenix, Arizona but not San Francisco. And the, the idea there is really simple. Um, we get better valuations by investing in companies in underrepresented markets. And if you're in the Bay, you're gonna have a much bigger valuation. So as a small fund of $40 million, at a half million dollars at a time, we can't write $5 million checks. Uh, we can write half million and million and a half dollar checks. Um, mentors. So mentorship is free. When you get to paid, it's not mentorship. It's, it's advisory, it's co-founders, it's board members, but the concept of mentorship is it's free. The flip side, to put it on you all, is to say, hey, if you call me for a fourth coffee in five weeks, it's no longer mentorship. Like, go make progress on your idea, go do the stuff that the mentors tell you to go do. You recognize that as you have more mentors, occasionally you will have this concept of mentor whiplash, which is, I talked to three people and they told me to do three different things. Yes, that's probably the case. And you as a CEO of your company need to figure out which advice you need to follow. So, and when it becomes a board, by the way, it's just as confusing. You have to remember that you run the company, the board is there to support you in those efforts, but not to make those decisions for you. That's the goal of being a good CEO ultimately, is being a good leader and having good vision. So mentors are important, um, but ultimately we're not here as mentors to for economic reward. I want Seattle to be a better place. I want to leave Seattle better than I found it. So if you're not from here and not going to hang out here, I still want to make sure you end up with good tools to take back to wherever home is. But if you're here, I want to help you grow a company and then exit and then reinvest in the Seattle startup community w as an investor or a limited partner in a fund. That's what I'm after. Professional services, legal and accounting folks, and I say real professionals because they're people who actually have training in those things. Um, there's people who We'll get to the avoiding some of the leeches of the startup ecosystem here in a little bit. And um, there's people who are great supports and there's people who are groupies and hang out. Uh, ultimately, large companies are part of that feeder network as well because Microsoft does buy companies, Google does buy companies. Um, but big companies, are at, at some point as you go into the big company, what you find is they lack innovation. So they've grown to a point where all of the innovators have basically left. But they do have at least two things you as a founder want. They have a massive customer base in most cases, and they have cash. So if you're doing something innovative that's complementary to them, they can be a great feeder for you for the startup ecosystem in Seattle. And they end up being great sponsors for what we do. Events. Uh, so Startup Week just ended two weeks ago. How many of you were at a Startup Week event? Oh, awesome. You guys rock. Um, thanks. When we first did it the first year, um, there were 1,600 attendees and then there were 2,800 attendees, and then there were 3,800 attendees, and then this year there's like 4,800 attendees. Um, so uh, every year it gets bigger. Uh, it is completely volunteer-led. None of us get paid. There's about 60 volunteers that run events. So if next year you're like, I'm super passionate about this track, I'd like to run this event, the answer is awesome. Go find somebody to co-chair the event with you, and then we'll help promote the event on your behalf. So what we do is we run in a very lean startup methodology, so the track captains, congratulations, you guys are track captains. You're going to run an event for whatever you're passionate about. We will help you. <laughs> we'll provide venue. We'll provide food. We'll provide beverage. Oh, you need to ask guests to speakers. Oh, you want to have Glenn Kelman come in. I'm happy to make an ask from Glenn. Right? So it's really about supporting you and what you're passionate about in the market as long as you can find a co-leader. Because if you can't sell a co-leader on why it's a good idea, it may be a little self-serving. So... We don't let people get on stage and present about their companies because that's not the point of Startup Week. It's all about you and how do we help you get ready for it. Um, meetups, 
Um, I'm kicking off a new meetup starting next week called Six Month Startup. It, it goes, it's a pre-launch of a book that I'm releasing later this year or next year um, that basically is the six monthly milestones from ideation to revenue that starts off with a monthly deadline of the homework you need to go do before you leave your day job. <laughs> so, because I know a bunch of founders on occasion who are like, they left their job at Microsoft, I sat down with them in their idea, and I'm like, I don't understand. Not that I am the litmus test of all great ideas, mind you, but you should find out from customers if they give a shit about your idea before you actually leave your day job. So the idea of the six month startup is it's really just six months of milestones and deliverables with mentors to get feedback on your idea and take you from ideation to revenue. The student ticket's $20 and the founder ticket's $35 and it includes dinner. The point of it is not to make money at it, the point of it is come test your idea. As an investor, the point of it for me is I wanna meet you two years before uh, you're fundable. So I have a relationship with you, I've got to know you, I see your product change. And honestly, there's a lot of founders who have, they're great founders, they just pick a bad idea. And it takes too long to kill bad ideas. And there's a difference between fail fast and kill bad ideas, right? Fail fast is painful. Killing bad ideas is smart. Y so keep in mind, you're not your idea. So if I'm critical of your idea, I'm not being critical of you. I'm not attacking you. I just think your idea sucks and probably isn't worth the next six years of your life. So I just wanna ask those critical questions early so that you pivot to an idea that may have a bigger market. So keep in mind, passion is important, but not sufficient to get you through eight years to launch a startup. So it's important, but not enough. So that's why you get critical feedback from a program like Six Month Startup. Startup Weekend and Hackathons, Madrona Venture Labs has a, a hackathon coming up for machi machine learning in a couple weeks. I think the event is Thursday next week and then two weeks later there's a the equivalent of a startup weekend. It's all focused on AI and machine learning. Strike that. I think it's all focused on blockchain. Sorry, this first one's focused all on blockchain. Um, so if you're interested in that, that one is one where they're trying to pull resources in the form of people into Madrona Labs to find talent to help them launch ideas and companies that they have the idea. The model there is different because it's their idea and their team and they're gonna provide developers and designers and they're gonna take a greater equity stake of the company than if you founded it yourself. Which is kind of cool because you're really de-risking your idea. And in order to de-risk the idea, they get more equity than you would traditionally get as an investor. But you also kind of get paid, which doesn't suck, right? So these are all new kind of models that we're looking at going, some of them are gonna work, some of them aren't gonna work. Ignite is a, a speaker series that happens about every other month, so Ignite Seattle. And there's a ton of other events and meetups and things that you could consider that just get you into groups that you're like, this is my tribe, right? This is the group of people I wanna go hang out with. So look at meetup.com for Seattle. You can look in tech, you can look in business, you can look in startups, and you'll find a ton of events. And if you're so inspired the one you want, then I would suggest you start it. So during Startup Week, we ran an IP track founders wanted. Did anybody attend one of those? Awesome, so one. So we ran this with the idea of like, hey, there's a bunch of intellectual property out there at UW CoMotion and Pacific Northwest National Labs and Allen Institute Artificial Intelligence. What if we brought all those people up on stage and said, you guys are looking for founders, what kind of IP and technologies do you have? Well, it ended up being 70 people almost at every event. So it's like, because there's intellectual property there that those companies are trying to get out. So like Intellectual Ventures over in Bellevue, is Nathan Mirvold's company. The company is uh, amazingly deep in intellectual property and IP, just like CoMotion is here from an IP perspective from the university and research. And it's IP that if you are a founder and you're looking for an idea, my original quest in this whole process was, I just asked them the questions that I wanted to know the answers to. Like, if I sold a company and I'm now looking for a new company, do you guys have something I should take out to market? Like, I'm a go-to-market CEO, that's kind of what I'm good at. So IP, that meetup had 110 people sign up that first week at Startup Week. Totally shocked me, because I was like, it's an interesting idea, I thought it was just more about my idea, and then found out eh, there's 110 people who thought it was interesting. So it's a quarterly meetup now. All right, resources. So from a community calendar perspective, there's a ton of calendars out there. GeekWire and S Startup Seattle are two of the best calendars that have events that are out there. GeekWire will skew towards Ex more expensive event from a founder perspective, where uh, Startup Digest is the newsletter th for Seattle. You can go sign up, and uh, Red Rusick puts out a, a weekly email. It's one of the products I ran when I was at Up Global, 
and we have about, I think there's 200 cities worldwide that have a Startup Digest. So type in Startup Digest, click on Seattle, email, subscribe to it. You'll get a curated list of events every week delivered Monday morning to your inbox. So, and if you want to promote your event, you just have to post it on uh, Startup Digest for Seattle as well, and Rad will go through and uh, he curates out of all the events that are available just to tell you what stuff that might be interesting for you this week. Groups. <coughs> so the Washington Technology Industry Association is a group here locally that most of the big companies join, but they're super supportive of startups as well, and they do events that help startups in that capacity. And then ultimately my comment with groups is follow the cash. So if there's cash spent on doing a group, the question is how much is it and is it worthwhile? So there's, a, there's some other events out there that every once in a while I've chuckled. When we did Startup Week the very first year, it corresponded with a mobile app development conference. And the person who was running the conference came to me and said, hey, that's awesome. We would love to like have you promote our event. And I'm like, I'm sure you would. I'm like, are you free? And they're like, no, our tickets are $400. I'm like, we won't do it, right? We had a car share service offer us ticket discounts for VIPs. And I'm like, you're totally missing the point of Startup Week. At Startup Week, everybody is a VIP. Like, that's the point of Startup Week. Like, shuttling the speakers around is not really what we're, that's kind of totally inverted to what, we, what we're after. So, and that's why the startup community events are so cheap and inexpensive. It's really about you. Because there's, if in case you haven't noticed, startup founders really don't have any excess money to spend on stuff that they don't need. So we'd rather you go test your idea. So, all right, physical resources. You know about some of them from the UW here at Comotion and Startup Hall, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in the start of Startup Hall. Um, there's co-working spaces on the east side. There's, there's maker spaces on both sides. There's tons of uh, co-working spaces, even for um, Riveter on Capitol Hill. It's a female first, but not female only co-working space. So they're doing really, really cool stuff around groups of people that, again, help you kind of find your tribe. Like, where do you fit? The, the difference in some of those places have to do with, are you an individual or are you a team? Wha how big is your team? Are you a consulting company or do you have ambitions to grow a startup? All of them really kind of have their own DNA. So Impact Hub, for example, tends towards social purpose startups. Galvanize tends to be bigger teams. WeWork feels like a habit trail to me and is mostly like individual um, solopreneurs, if you will, people who are running their own business. Whatever happens to fit the DNA of where you are at with the business, go check them out. Get a free day, see what it's like, see how much it costs. Um, working remote from your house can be tough, right? So being out and socializing with other people who are doing the same sort of stuff, super helpful. Um, oh, just a couple, ver in case you're in the healthcare side, Cambry Grove is an example of a vertical that's very focused on healthcare only. Um, so there's some good things in those ones too. All right, from my perspective to help you as a founder, help you understand a couple things about the startup ecosystem, your need for cash has nothing to do with your ability to raise cash. So a lot of people are like, I have an idea and all I need is $75,000 and then it would be amazing. And I'm like, wrong order, right? The, what you wanna do first is go prove your idea in what we call customer development before you ask for a check. So the days of, when I did my first startup, so my first startup went from zero to 32 million in sales in four years. I pretty much made every mistake a first time founder could make as a CEO from a hiring perspective, a growth perspective, right? When you get to 150 employees, there's a lot of room for error and I made most of those mistakes. In when I started that company, you could do kind of the back of the napkin and go, I have an idea, but today you can't. Today, um, the good news though of that is I had to raise $12 million just to have enough servers and server farms and software and Salesforce and stuff that we had to implement on a local basis that I could probably rent today on Amazon Web Services for 500 bucks versus like two data centers and a, right, all that hardware that I don't need. So it's become much more capital efficient to raise, uh, to start a company, but you still need to have traction before you actually get to raise money. From a program perspective, obviously here at the UW, the entrepreneurship program is great, both on an MBA and an undergraduate level. Seattle University has a great program. I mentioned the six-month startup program. These are ones that you pay various levels, right, and how much you pay, and then there's ones that are funded. So in the case of Fledge and Looney, who will be here next week, you go crowdsource your funding for your participation in that program. And the idea of that is if you can get a Kickstarter campaign to fund the cash for the program, 
you have some good customer development and validation that people actually care about what you're going to make. If you can't articulate what it is you're trying to make, no Kickstarter campaign is going to get behind you, which is a good indication of, I know it was English, and I know it was in a sentence structure, but I have no idea what you're talking about, which happened to me on a call this morning where it was like a social, it was one of those where I'm like, <coughs> what was it? It was so nauseating I lost track. Um, and I knew it was English, and, I, and, I, and I'm like, but I'm like, so are you building an app? No, 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 it's not an app. Like, so you're building a website? No, 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 it's not a website. And we finally got around to, it's a website and with an app. I'm like, I'm building an app with a website. I'm like, just a social support app, or social support, uh, uh, it'll come back to me. But it was so, it was like, I'm like, I had to stop the founder and say, I just have to tell you right now that I'm, I'm so befuddled by what you're saying, I'm, I'm slightly nauseous, and it's gonna take me a few more sentences to catch back up to you, right? Because I'm, like, I'm like, I just don't know what you're talking about. So don't use jargon. Like, tell people what it's gonna do, what outcome you expect it to have. So Techstars is a program that's open right now. I think they're just closing the current cohort. Um, I was just over at Startup Hall doing coaching for the Alexa Accelerator. Um, they have their demo day um, with Alexa next Tuesday. And those programs, those accelerator programs, put on average $40,000 of cash into the company up front and then have a $100,000 convertible note at the end after you graduate for about 7% of your company. So various teams, various stages, Kernel Labs is hosted here as well. So very, very much a range of engagement models and how much cash you get versus equity you get based on a little bit of who you are. So if you're a serial entrepreneur, um, I won't give up as much equity as if you're a first-time entrepreneur. But if you're a first-time entrepreneur with chops and, and has passion about a particular idea, there's folks like Allen Institute that would write you a check and loan you a data scientist because the idea is in line with what they want to go develop. So lots of resources in that capacity. From an investor perspective, this is your list of investors. I'm going to give you some coaching on investment. So angel investors are awesome. They're part of the ecosystem. They're amazing. There's two ways to engage with angel investors, one-on-one -on -one and one-to-many. The one-to-many always sounds very compelling from an angel group perspective. Angel groups don't generally write lead term sheets. And what that means is somebody will come along and say, hey, I'm gonna raise a half million dollars to go fund my company. And somebody will go, love the idea, love what you're working on, let me know when you find a lead investor. So what that means is, they're looking for somebody like us as a venture capital fund to do the due diligence, validate the idea, and have somebody go like, oh, Dave's in the deal. And then other people go, oh, if Dave's in the deal, I know he's done the due diligence, I know he's looked at the company, I know he's looked at the technology, oh, we'll write a check. So angel groups are useful if 50% of your round of funding is raised. If not, they are not useful. And will, will they take the meeting? Yes. Uh, will Caretsu Forum take $1,500 per location to have you pitch your idea? Yes. Is that a good use of your money? No. Maybe never. So I have strong opinions about that. You can talk to me later if you want to know. Um, where you can go to Gary Rubin's Angels Pitches and Beer event. It's a meetup. It happens about once every other month. It's free. Pacific Northwest Venture Club is free. 25 or $50 to apply for, and Gary does that to filter out people who don't have any money at all. So I don't know if you know this, but if you have no money, doing a startup isn't gonna happen. So sorry if that's crushing news to any of you, and, but the most uh, to the founders in us is like, Dave, I know 92% of startups fail, but I know I'm not in the 92%, <laughs> right? Because we're generally slightly delusional, or we wouldn't do startups, right? So if you can't afford the Puget Sound Venture Club $50 application fee, go get a job, save up some money, because you, you're gonna need some runway to get this idea off the ground. So they're super reasonably priced things, don't pay to present. So early venture capital, we're in the early stage, Founders Co-op, who is, uh, Chris DeVore is based over in Startup Hall as well. Um, we do early stage checks for early stage deals. Now, investors like themes, so like the deal I was talking to this morning, they're like, they're building the mobile app to help with fundraising for events. I'm like, that's interesting, but if you don't have traction, so a couple things you need, you need a team, solo entrepreneurs don't get founded, or don't get funded, 
So you need a, a team and co-founders. It's part of our validation that if you can't sell a co-founder on leaving their day job to join you full time, I you're not going to sell me either. So if you don't have a co-founder yet, mission number one, go find a co-founder. Go find the events that get you with the groups of people who are the co-founders that you need to go meet. Come to an event like Six Month Startup. Right, Just find the events that get you out with the co-founders. So that's an important start. From a VC perspective then, we like themes. So right now, um, I'm, I, we probably won't do cryptocurrencies, but I'm really interested in blockchain for the enterprise. Do I care much about AI? A little bit. Do I care a lot more about machine learning? Absolutely. Solving complex problems, we lean towards business to business, but we'll do business to consumer. So, but if you don't have a team and you don't have a product, and you don't have the start of traction, like some data around the numbers, then institutional money is really difficult to go raise. And the reason is, is if the six of you are my limited partners and invested in my fund, I have a charter that says, I invest in this type of deal, right? And then you come to me and say, hey, I've got a really cool deal, but it's not in the charter. I can't invest in it. Because they're gonna come back to me and say, you said you were gonna invest in this and you invested in that. Why did you do that? And the answer is, I'm not gonna do that. So. If you don't know what their charter is and you don't know what type of sta <coughs> both stage and verticals they invest in, you need to go do your research. So you can find it on their website. You can find it on a site called Crunchbase. And if you look up a fund, it will tell you everything they've invested in and the average size checks they write. If their average size check is $10 million, they're not going to invest in an early stage deal because it takes as much work to be a do the due diligence and be a board member for a half million dollar check as it does for a $10 million check. So just know what's both stage appropriate and vertical market appropriate. All right, so S Seven Peaks, Founders Co-op, and the Heather Redmond's fund is called Flying Fish. We work with these folks all the time. Uh, we're just starting relationships with Kernel Labs. We work with Madrona uh, Venture Lab. We work with Pioneer Square Lab. We're in the business of getting our six limited partners the best return we can get. So do we care about other things? Yes, but ultimately the limited partners are after the return. So all the things we do in the community is about building a community. Um, so that's important to us too. Then when you get to bigger venture stage funds, Madrona does write early stage checks on occasion, particularly if they know the founder and they've worked with a founder before in the past. But the fund is a $350 million fund. Their average check is a lot bigger than our average check. So there's differences in how funds operate that way. Voyager Capital, Ignition, and Mavron. Um, the first three are geography focused. Mavron is, is vertically market focused. So Mavron was originally Howard Schultz's money and now has more investors than just Howard. But they're good at retail. So anybody had a Panera, been to Panera Bread? So they back Panera. So they like retail concepts and they're not geographically limited and that's their investment thesis. So again, you're back to the charter. The charter has an investment thesis. It dictates what we invest in. So when I invest my own money, I can be like, Tony, your idea is amazing, and I really like you. And other than going back and being able to articulate your message to my wife that explains why I wrote a check for that, which is still somebody I have to get approval from, right? Because you want to be able to go like, so here's the quick message of the takeaway for you on this topic. If your investor that you just pitched can't repeat your pitch, they will not write you a check. Because ultimately, angels like to invest in things where they have passion and people they believe in and maybe brag about it at a cocktail party. So if they walk away going, wow, you're really smart, but I have no idea what you said, and you'll ask them, so did all this make sense? And they'll go, because that's human nature. I don't want to look like a dumbass, so yes, so I'll answer yes. And you're like, I, the meeting went really well. Dave, it was amazing. They totally got what I was doing. And I'm like, oh, I, don't, I don't think so. But hey, maybe they'll call you back. But it's like at the start of a bad dating relationship where you're like, call me. Not happening. So you just need to know that that's the process. And VCs, right, we get paid to take meetings. So am I going to meet with you too early? Probably. But I want to track your progress and see if you did what you said you're going to do and all those things are important to us. All right, that's venture. Introductions help, but aren't required. So this is kind of an awkward, this is the bad historic side of venture capital I'm not super fond of. It's one of the things we're trying to change in Seattle. In the Valley, people say, hey, listen, we only take meetings with people where we get hard introductions by people we know. 
which really limits the selection process into middle-aged white dudes who went to schools like the UW. So the answer is, you don't need an introduction to talk to me. That's why I'm here. I'm looking for deal flow. The stuff I talk to people about today is going to make us money in four to six years. So we just have to have a very long-term view of it. So if you talk to somebody who says, we only talk with, with people who have you know, hard introductions by people we know, just walk away. Find There's better VCs out there than, than do that, because this is a selection bias problem we need to move past. Um, now, make sure you go accomplish something first, however. So don't come to me with an idea. Come to me with data. So what I always tell first-time founders is, hey, listen, you have an opinion. I have an opinion in a checkbook. If you want the checkbook, you need an opinion in data. So if you said, hey, Dave, I talked to 50 people, and this is what they told me, then all of a sudden my opinion is willing to change. But if you're like, I have an opinion, and I'm super passionate about it, you should give me a check. No. <laughs> but if you're like, I have an opinion, and I talked to 50 people, and I know you think this, but 42 of the 50 people said they would buy it, I'd be like, we should talk. Maybe we should grab a coffee. Right? So it's that's my filter process of like, should I take a meeting with somebody or not? Is tell me about your customer traction. Do you have revenue? Do you have a product? Do you have a team? So those are all things you need to accomplish first. Get clear with your ask. And this sounds really easy, but <laughs> as a founder, sometimes it's clear in my head, but it's not clear when I talk to you. Right? And I walk away from those meetings going, I I know there was something you were trying to get across. I know there was an ask that you were but it just wasn't clear. So make sure it kind of passes the mom test. So I'll give you some advice I got from a flight to New York. I met with a company called Warburg Pincus. Um, Samantha Chen was a managing partner of the fund. Warburg Pincus is the largest private equity company in the country. Massive, massive fund. And she was walking me into the elevator and said, Dave, I love your passion for the market. We love this space. You're obviously very smart. I can't repeat your message to my partners, so I won't. And I rode down the elevator thinking, well, shit, that was a waste of a trip to New York for that one meeting. And the bigger aha was I should have been more prepared than that. So it was expensive lesson for me, hopefully a cheap lesson for you. But if you go talk to a venture capitalist, I'm going to pick on Tony again, and I work for Tony, and Tony says, hey, Dave, did you see any interesting deals this week? And I can't repeat your idea to Tony in an articulate way. My answer will be, nope, I didn't see any interesting deals this week. Because it's not my job to package up your message to make it look, look, make me look smart to Tony. So your job is to make it super simple for me to package up your message so I can repeat it to my partners. So we do this every week we do a partner meeting, and every week we say, what deals did we see? And of the 25 deals I looked at in September, two of them got to a point where they had enough traction, they, the right pieces were coming together where I'd present it to the team. The rest of them were like, mm, no, not yet. Like, hey, is that? W did you meet with these guys? Yeah, I met with them. They're not ready yet, right? So you need to come with traction and come with data. Um, that will help you. And then use your network to get introductions. Um, gosh, we're at s you know Chris is at Startup Week. I'm at Startup Week. We're at s we're we're out in the community because we're out to go meet you. Um, I don't carry a card. In case you didn't notice. Like, oh wait, my blog's there, my email's there, my Twitter handle's there, right? At some point, I at started adding to these slides the, do you guys know what this is? Anybody? Somebody's gotta know. L-M-G-T-F-Y. Let me Google that for you. Dave, how come you didn't put links into blah, blah, blah on your slide presentation? Let me Google that for you. So please, it's right there. You can Google it. It's totally awesome. Um, I, part of it is we wanna, I want to see that people are willing to go do the work. And I'm weird because I'll meet with somebody and give them a suggestion of, hey, go do this. And then I'll see them at an event a month later. And they'll be like, hey, I want to meet with you. I'm like, did you go do the thing that we talked about? And they're like, oh, you remember. I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> it's the same stuff. Like, go talk to customers. All right. Uh, clear ask. All right, avoiding the leeches. So let me give you a couple quick tips about people you can run away from. It'll save you time at events. There are the never sponsors. They're the people who are there to sell their services at an event that somebody else has paid for. 
just walk away. We do development services for early stage startups. Nope, just walk away. We do offshore development services. Nope, just walk away. Because they're going to take a lot of your time, but they don't sponsor the community. They're just kind of trying to take from the community. And the principle of this is like, listen, come give first. Be part of the process. Uh, wantrepreneurs, I can't tell you the number of people I met who are always going to launch something but never seem to launch something, which makes me kind of sad. Right? So if you're going to launch something, launch something. There's people who are there for just the free food. Some of you may be here. Um, those are the startup groupies. And the last one, and probably the worst one, is what I call the, the fundraisers. It's the people who are like, I will help you raise money for your company for 6 or 7% fee of whatever I help you raise. Run the fuck away from those people because they're not actually licensed broker dealers and it's not actually, they can't actually do it, right? And they're going to introduce you to the same people you're going to meet through the free meetups anyway. So fundraising is hard. As a CEO, you have to do the work. So no one's going to do it for you. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to do it yourself. Ultimately, I don't want to talk to a fundraising person. I want to talk to you, right? So does it take an introduction to get to it? No, just send an email. So those are just people you should avoid. So regional markets, a few notes here, and then I'm going to open up for you guys' questions. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on from Vancouver to Bend and Portland. Um, I grew up in Portland, came here to go to, to college. Um, Portland has a chip on its shoulder that we're not Seattle. Seattle has a chip on its shoulder that we're not San Francisco. Listen, we don't need to be San Francisco. We just need to be a kick-ass Seattle. That's good, right? Portland, we're, we're the largest venture capital fund in Oregon. That's not a high bar, right? So, I mean, like, orders of magnitude difference between Washington and Oregon. It's kind of sad. But I'm glad we are. But is that a big, it's not really a big deal. So it looks good on the map, though. Our logo is all over Oregon. So, um, the, the challenge with east side versus west side is a couple of issues. I live on the east side. There's not a lot of co-working space on the east side. The reason you don't have startup density on the east side compared to Pioneer Square is there's not a lot of uh, flexible Class B office space that's walking distance to restaurants. To get that in Bellevue, you have to go over to like Northrop and some, you know, it's just like it's really, there's not a lot of space that's flexible. So when I launched my first company, we went from three people to 30 people in less than a year. And the landlord want me to sign a five-year lease? I don't know how many people I want to be in five months, let alone five years, right? So we ended up having to find sublets. And, and but in Pioneer Square, there's lots of co-working spaces now. There's lots of flexible space. That's why you don't see a lot of startups on the east side. It's not that all that complex. There's also an east side stack and a west side stack. So the mean stack is a west side stack, so open source. And the .NET stack is the east side stack. Happens to be where people were, you know, Microsoft more on the east side. So no big surprises with that, but that's kind of the reason there's a big delta. Can you build a startup in the east side? Sure. Ultimately, you're going to compete with talent on the west side. It's just a business decision. Um, there's lots of stuff happening from Vancouver, the Cascadia process. We're trying to find our identity, but honestly, the chips on our shoulders just kind of keep us in our own way at times, which is a bummer. But if you're super passionate about that, I'm happy to introduce you to people who care a lot about that topic. So plugging in for you, um, this is a, a, a text message from your bank that says you don't have enough funds for this one. So um, give first. So Techstars hashtag is just give first. So the idea is, is go volunteer, uh, go support, help do a registration at a check-in, join a meetup, like go give back in the community first. There's lots of people I recognize because I've seen them at multiple events. Um, and yet there's still people who are like, my idea is so good, I don't need to give first. I'm just going to go ask. And the answer is, eh, we'll see. <laughs> so I would just suggest that you give first. Build relationships. That means it's more than just networking. It actually is how can I help you, right? It's the how do I help you? Who can I introduce you to? What would be useful for you? What can I do for you, not what can I take? And the more you're known for being a giver in that er circumstance, the better it's going to serve you. So I get asked frequently, why are you still doing networking? Everybody knows who you are in Seattle. That's not true, but I do know the people who know everybody in Seattle. But the answer is, is that I just want Seattle to be a better place for, s for startups, because startups are freaking hard. Like 92% failure rate means we have a lot of emotionally scarred founders wandering around Seattle, right, who are on the <laughs> brink of rehab. And it's, it's the case because it's like, but people, in isolation, it's really hard. 
right? So being there to be a support and being willing to talk about it is really hard. But that's part of why we're here and part of what we're doing. And the next generation of, of entrepreneurs are the people I want to invest in. Um, so volunteer. Um, so I, I was trying to make the point here is that I know that you're special, but keep in mind in my world, everybody's special. So you're, norm, you're no more special than everybody else. And because every once in a while I get, I get attacked by somebody who's super special and I'm like, ooh, just it's a bad sign. So somebody uh, approached me earlier before Startup Week this year and they're like, so um, I know we met last year and I'd like to volunteer to be a speaker. I'm like, on what? Like, what have you accomplished over the last year? Well, I'm really, really committed to this new blockchain. I'm like, should you ship something to blockchain? No, but I'd be a great speaker at it. And I'm like, no, that's bad. That's just like, that so doesn't even resonate with me at all. I'm like, I would not, we, the, one of the things I love about Startup Week, we don't import any speakers for the most part. Chase may bring somebody in who's a motivational speaker, but this is all about Seattle and you connecting with people who are doing cool stuff in Seattle. So we don't bring in speakers or charge $600 for a ticket because we want you to connect with people in Seattle even after the event's over. It's part of the important part of it. So what do you do when you get that meeting? Have an agenda. By the way, I know you have an agenda when you send me a note about having coffee. On my blog, there's a I want to have coffee with Dave note. And if you don't read it, I will point you back to it and say, hey, awesome. Answer these questions first because if you answer these questions when you come to the meeting, I can actually help you. If, y if I ask you the questions at the meeting, I won't be able to help you because I'll just be asking you the questions that you should have read on the blog post. So you need to have an agenda, have one, know what it is. Um, so, and as you go through this process of meeting people, like these sort of events, how do you help them? Who can you introduce them to? How do you, right, how do you wanna help them get a job? Your value proposition, who are you? What's memorable? Anybody found fake Grimlock on Twitter? My favorite dinosaur on Twitter, Albert knows that. I love it, fake Grimlock is awesome. He, he types in all caps, but his, um, his point on this one is be bacon, don't be bread. Like I met somebody and it was like, it, would, they be, would I put him in the white bread category or the bacon category? You wanna be bacon, like be memorable. Like how am I gonna remember you? Like what, what stood out? Versus like, I'm kinda like, you know, maybe white bread. Like, not gonna remember. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna make something remembered from this, be bacon, or look up fake Grimlock and follow him on Twitter. I think it's a him, I'm not sure. He's, he's a T-Rex, he has really short arms. No one really knows who fake Grimlock is. Um, share, share, share your idea. Uh, ultimately, ideas die from lack of exposure, not overexposure. So if you get a chance to talk with somebody, especially who has experience in startups, and you're like, I'm gonna keep my precious precious. Or it's such a part of my identity, I can't handle the criticism. Don't do it, like go share your idea. Get out to events and say, I have this idea, this is what I'm thinking about. I do it even now, right? So T.A. McCann is a friend who hangs out here on occasion. T.A. is an engineer by background, so he's a little bit more systematic. He'd be like, hey Clive, Dave, nice to meet you. Are, and he's, he's got three questions in his head to go, is Clive my target customer or not? Oh, Clive's not my target customer. Hey Tony, nice to meet you, right? And he's like super systematic about it. And I'm like, a little cold, but I'm like, you know, he was on a mission to like, is do, uh, does anybody care about this idea? And you know, it, it was I was just it was watching him work the room, and I'm like, this is really funny. But he's just, you know, I'm just testing my idea. But he's like, you know, and most people are like, I don't want to test my idea. Somebody, I'm, somebody to be critical of it. Just go test your idea. That's a big help. What to do next? This is not, by the way, what to do next. Dave, quick question. We're working on a new product in the process of selecting people to interview, just answering several simple questions. Would you like to be a participant? No. Now I just delete these. But I was trying to be nice because it was somebody in Seattle. I'm not sure. I'm useful. Can you give me more topics about the interview? We're building a CRM type service that wanted to get people's feedback to know how they're communicating with their clients and other people. I'm 100% sure you'd be useful for feedback. <sighs> Nauseating room closing in, darkness happening. Uh, so what's know your value proposition, right? And don't lead with a bunch of jargon. And a cold introduction like that, not helpful. So some of you may be in the cold email camp. I am not. I think it's just, a, I think it's just spam. But know what you're gonna do and, and don't hurt yourself by stepping on a landmine. All right, um, so <laughs> One of the things I love about, Brad Feld used to be on my board, he's a, uh, kind of a big investor in, in Boulder, and 
Um, Brad would always say, people would come to him and say, hey, I'm new to Boulder, what do I need to do? And Brad would be like, he'd give them three things to go do. Like, go do this, join a meetup, go to this thing, go, right? And he's like, well, will you introduce me to so-and-so? He's like, no, go do these three things. He's like, 95% of people never do those three things and come back and ask for an intro. So I'm not gonna do the work for you. I'm gonna ask you some questions. You're gonna have to go do the work. And then if you don't do the work and come up to me a month later and say, hey, can we meet again? The answer is no, because <laughs> I want you to go do the work. Um, ask in relative to your, your relationship, right? Gary Rubens at the bottom of his email signature says, time's my most valuable resource. I promise I won't waste yours, which I totally appreciate. So come prepared, know what you're asking for, and then just add value, right? Two paragraphs, so on, on if you have a LinkedIn request and you're sending me a note, hey Dave, will you introduce me to XYZ? Um, I had a board member one time that said, would you introduce me to somebody you, guys, you all would know from a CEO perspective in town? And I'm like, of course, he's, he's my board member, of course I'd introduce him. So I'm like, of course, happy to do it. And I immediately got an email back with the two paragraphs. Hey Dave, thanks for taking the time to introduce me to Rich Barton. Um, we're doing, and then second paragraph two is, we're doing blah, 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 and this is why we think it would be interesting. Right. If I have to interpret your message and do the work for you, I'm not going to forward the email. I'm not going to not going to do the LinkedIn request. So you have to do it for me, right? So and by the way, you know your product better than I know your product anyway. Okay. Um, embracing failure. Uh, if you notice the name on the top, this is not Photoshop. This is my grandfather's garage in 1911. He had the first Ford garage in Camas, Washington. So they shipped Model T parts and then they would reassemble them out here. And in case you didn't notice, this is the gas station right here. So this was pre-distributed gasoline. It was just barrels. He was a little early. He sold this company too early, but he did buy the first phone company in southwestern Washington. And then he sold that too early. So, I mean, entrepreneurship is one of those things you just have to embrace the fact that 92% are going to fail. Kill bad ideas fast. Don't fail fast. So separate you from your idea. If it's a bad idea, kill the idea. You don't have to fail fast. You can kill bad ideas fast. Please do that better. That's a much better way to do it. Um, so my ask to you. So if you continue to, to be part of the Seattle startup community, mentor people who need your help. When you have an exit, reinvest 10% of your, your gains back into startups in the ecosystem. And my number one request is mentor people who don't look like you. So we tend to gravitate towards people who are like us for all kinds of reasons. And my request is just mentor people who don't look like you. It's a great place to start. You can take action on it today. There's always somebody who's behind you who needs help. Um, do great things, invest in the community. And my favorite Yoda quote, there is no try, there is only do. So you've got about 10 minutes of questions. I'm happy to answer anything I can answer for you. <laughs> awkward, awkward finish. What can I answer for you? Really? Yeah, go for it. It's just the groups of people you're going to hang out with who care more about the social enterprise aspect of it. We, we care about it, but our limited partners ultimately, it's funny, when you raise money from limited partners, ultimately they say, yeah, 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 we care about that, but ultimately we care about the return. Right, which is not really a surprising thing about the human nature thing side of it. So just know that there's communities like that, whether it's Impact Hub or other meetups, they're going to have more of a social impact angle to it. Both are both are good. So, but align with people who think the way that you think about it. Wow, so it's easy. Go for it. So on the investor side, you won't find a lot of, so M Mavron does invest in uh, consumer-based products, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a physical, is physical product? Yes. Okay, so you're going to go to distribution and retail or direct sales on the web sort of stuff? Uh, All, okay. Yeah. The good news is there's only a few choices, so you just have to pick one, yeah. right? Versus like, there's a bunch of stuff we cover in the six-month startups. It's like, okay, there's four ways to sell product, five ways if you count retail, right? And it's like, so you just like pick one and then go that direction until you find out that it doesn't work, right? And then pick a different one. 
So um, versus like we're creating our own sales process, you're like, mm, no, you're not. There's only so many ways to do it. So there are investors who care about those things. The early angel investors will care about the product and will care about it from a passion perspective. So it's really finding those people who are like, I really love your idea and I think you're really awesome, right? Then you have to go to a different market to find cash for an institutional money for that cash. But that's easy to find because you can go to uh, Crunchbase and look at companies like yours and see where they've raised money in the past. And those investors are listed there so you can go back and say what types of things do they invest in and find that. So most of the money I raised for the first company, I came out of New York, not out of Seattle. <coughs> so. Yeah, so Ignition uh, was enterprise B2B in the past. Um, they're so uh, there are three managing partners <coughs> for Ignition. Uh, they're very focused on enterprise software, uh, machine learning uh, related, and s uh, crypto and um, is going to be a big one of their big focuses. So all of us, all of the funds have their thesis on either deliberately stated on their site, or you can look at their portfolio companies and get a pretty good idea of what they invest in. So they're a much bigger fund than we are. They're about a $400 million fund. So we, we tend to invest, because we're a small fund, we'll invest early with the founders, but when you go raise the A and B round, we our checkbook's not big enough to write a $5 million check. Ignition's gonna come in and want we want 20% of the company. When you raise the next round, we're gonna keep our 20% of the company. Raise the next round, we're gonna keep our 20. So those are progressively larger checks. Our fund isn't that big, so we invest early with the founders with the idea of, hey, we want to help you not get diluted, I not take more cash than you need to take, because when you get diluted, we get diluted, right? So we want to help you stair-step to the next level and help do that. So that's the difference in fund thesis. And then Voyager is also a tech company that they have a new partner who just started here in Seattle, but they did a lot of investments in San Francisco for the last few years, and they're finally reinvesting back in Seattle, which is kind of cool. Yeah, back in the back. Um, that's a great question. There's some that are memorable, but I wouldn't invest in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question around what pitches got me the most excited based on am I willing to go of the. So like uh, we announced September 1st that I was joining the fund, and because it was Startup Week, and because I've been around the community for so long, it was like completely overwhelming, right? Like look at 25 deals in 30 days. It was silly. Like, I hope this doesn't continue because I'll be back to drinking. <laughs> so um, so the deals that I really like is where they're, they're crisp about the value proposition. They know who their customer is, right? So over the course of the few months or the years or however long they've been working on it, they went from, our customer is everybody who's right-handed. And you're like, mm, no, it's not. And they're like, our customer is the IT manager that does such and such. And the keys that got me super excited about those deals is their sales cycle went from four to six months, which was like, we think the customer looks like this and the demo kind of is like this and here's the value proposition and pitch to where the demo became super sharp and their customer segment became super focused and their value proposition resonated with people and their sales cycle went from four to six months to four to six days. And I'm like, oh, I, we should have coffee, right? Because when you start to see there's this concept of the J-curve for startups, right? So there's, at launch I look like this and then I have this, this kind of pit of despair phase of like trying to find product market fit and hoping that our people care about the product. And then at some point you hit the J-curve. The biggest indication of J-curve is sales cycle and revenue growth. So when I start to see that happen, I'm like, I'm super interested, right? But I'll meet with folks earlier than that and I'll end up counseling them a lot around like, okay, well, here's what I'd wanna see and before like when you see this happen, let's talk. Because I can't change that dramatically for them. So those ones I really like a lot. We, we have an investment thesis around particular technologies, but most everything in venture and angel investing is, you, like I've got this set of guidelines, but are they hard and fast rules? Not really. So if I like you and I like the idea, but you're early, I'm gonna coach and watch and see if you are teachable and you're doing the stuff that we talked about not because I'm always right, but because industry data says I, I'm a pretty good guess of what you're gonna have to do, right? So those are the ones I get the most excited about. And sometimes they're not the most technology oriented, but it's like, because we're gonna invest early, the odds are I'm gonna be on the board for five plus years. So I, you know, 
if I don't like you, I'm probably not going to invest in you, not because you're not a good person, but because we just didn't like hit it off, right? Because that matters too. It's a, it's a very interesting relationship. Yeah? Um, so I'm from New Bedford, North Carolina. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, you were doing RCRA uh, uh, for 15. Yep. Do you want to include uh, any, any insight regarding the GRL uh, the 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 data says we overinvested in it three years ago, and the return looks to be 2023. So it's a it's a space right now that if you're a geek, so GeekWire did an interview with uh, a bunch of VCs last week, and one of the questions they asked about you know what's the most overhyped space, and the answer was ARVR. So until there's a killer app that people can get their head around, even though hardware prices are coming down with the announcement from Facebook yesterday, super cool, but still overhyped space, and it's going to take a lot of time to kind of mature into the cash that's already gone into it. So right now I would lean away from that one because I just don't see the killer app yet. One more question. Yeah? Can you recommend for um, students in the technology classes mm -hmm. um, and you know, how, how far to go through the process for talking to customers and developing an idea and, and then have a shorter time than all the things you have to maybe they don't need yeah, you can still get out and do customer interviews, and you, the one benefit you have is you have you get to play the student card. Mm -hmm. Like I don't get to play the student card, so mm -hmm. it's one of those where people are like, so are you paying me for this interview time? Versus you're like, hey, I'm a student at UW, and I can, and then crank through as many customer interviews as you can and iterate on what it is you learn as you go through the interview process. But I always like to sit on face to face with somebody and see if I can like look them in the eye, and if their pupils dilate, then I'm like, I want to ask the next question, like the five whys, right? Which is, why did you react to that? Like, what did how would you use it? Right, so I'm always I want to get face to face with customers and ask them questions, and you get to play the, the s with the student card and you'd be like, and I'm a student, and people are like, oh yeah, I'll help a student. Versus like, if you're like just a founder, y it's like that that one's a bummer when you can't play that card anymore. <laughs> so just do as many of them as you can. Thank you all very much for having me. Appreciate it. Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>